so I'm actually, what I'm going to talk about is a little something different. I'm going to talk about how uh, these forces that shaped um, human genetic diversity and relatedness between individuals actually affect our ability to identify which variants are involved in traits. So the standard approach uh, that people use to try to find variants as, uh, associated with traits is the standard association study. And in this case, you take a bunch of individuals. Here, this is a toy example. Each row is an individual. A few of the positions uh, differ um, in, each, in, in this toy example. There's two positions. And what you do is you correlate the uh, genetic variation with the trait to try to identify uh, locations that are correlated, because those might be variants that are involved in the trait. So in this example, it's pretty obvious which one of these two um, variants is correlated with uh, blood pressure. Um, the, the way I like to think about um, how this kind of association test is done is just kind of visualize it just as a kind of a standard regression. Here you have uh, the two alleles. Each individual is a phenotype. Each individual's phenotype is a dot uh, on the plot. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to see which model fits better, either this kind of linear model um, with, with, uh, this, with no slope which is this kind of null hypothesis, no, no association, or a model that allows you to have a, a you know a difference in the in the means of the two uh, of the phenotype and of the two alleles. And essentially, you know, there's the details of how to do kind of this regression is uh, you know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of details, but essentially it's try to figure out which model, which of these two models fits better. Um, okay, so if uh, um, so this is again with the standard you know, all of the GWAS results that have been uh, found essentially use basically this standard linear model to do the association. They just look at, um, you know, and if we represent our individuals uh, in terms of matrices, which will be useful, um, Y is basically a column vector of size N. We have N individuals. X is the SNP that we're going to test, also a column uh, matrix. Mu is the population mean. Beta is basically the effect size of the SNP. So the individual, if we can think of the SNPs as either being 0 or 1 if you have it or, or not, um, or 0, 1, or 2, how many allele copies you have. And uh, the beta basically means how much of the phenotypic, what's the difference in phenotypic mean for uh, each of those, uh, differs in each of those cases. And then um, E is uh, basically the residual. So it's kind of the, what we think of the contribution for the environment. And in this case, we just think of them having some kind of uh, uh, being drawn with, uh, with mean zero and some, uh, some uh, variance, maybe sigma squared E. And in this case, since our, in, our data is actually a column vector of individuals, our, our residual is actually going to be essentially a multivariate normal where the covariance matrix is just going to be an identity matrix scaled by this variance. Okay, so if this is how we assume, this is how we're doing the test, but of course, um, this is not a realistic way to think about what's going on um, for how the, how, this is an actually realistic model for the, the trait. So kind of a more, a slightly more realistic model, um, which we can think of this kind of as a hypothetical true genetic model. If we, of course, we don't know uh, what the effect is of each variant, but we can assume that you know, there's many variants throughout the genome that are affecting the trait. So in this case, if these are, um, you know, we could imagine if, you know, uh, I, there's M variants in the genome, um, beta I is the effect of each one. Um, most of these will be zero, but, uh, you know, many will be non-zero. And um, so if, we could, if this is the, the true model that's kind of generating the data, and of course, this is a simplification because we're not allowing for kind of gene-gene interactions, there's no interaction effects, there's also, we're assuming that everything is additive as well, that's also not realistic. But I'm going to show that even under this assumption of this very simple model, like a lot of problems come up. So now let's look back again at when we're testing a single SNP in the context of this model. Okay, so now um, let's say I'm looking, I'm doing a GWAS and my data comes from this model where there's many SNPs that are associated. But I'm only looking at, I'm looking at one SNP at a time. Let's say that currently I'm looking at SNP K. What happens is that the data actually looks kind of like this. So um, K has an effect, but the other SNPs also have an effect. 
But when I'm doing my single, uh, my linear model to do the test, what I'm doing is I'm only looking at, um, I'm kind of ignoring these other, the, rest, the effect of the rest of the SNPs, okay? So this is what I'm calling unmodeled factors, okay? So in many cases, this isn't so bad, okay? This, this doesn't have an effect. Uh, because in, oftentimes these unmodeled factors will just increase the variance, okay? And, and when I'm doing this test, it'll get sucked up into, I mean, my variance estimate will be larger than what I expect it to be, okay? But it, you know, it'll kind of, I mean, I'm estimating the variance from the data, so it doesn't matter that my estimate or the variance in the data isn't the real one because somehow um, it, it'll, it'll work itself out. Um, but. Um, but, you know, and of course, another thing is, is that I want to emphasize that these factors are unknown. If I knew the effect sizes of all the other SNPs in, in, in the genome, then I wouldn't be doing association in the first place because why would I, why would I do that? I wouldn't know that. Um, okay, so now I'm going to give you an anecdote um, in, uh, in mouse genetics just to give you an idea of where these problems come with these unmodeled factors. Okay, so I work a lot in mouse genetics. Um, mice are... These are mostly what um, kind of like medical mouse genetics looks at these inbred strains of mice that are not really from a natural population. So they've been inbred. Uh, these are three different strains of mice. They obviously have very different um, observable phenotypic differences, but not only that, they have uh, just because of why they've been bred, they have many different human disease related phenotype differences. Like macular, some have macular degeneration, some are, are really susceptible to diabetes, um, et cetera. So um, if uh, uh, we were involved in a, in a study in 2007 looking at the, basically the genetic diversity of these mice in, involved in some kind of early sequencing study, and this is actually one of the figures of the paper to summarize um, kind of a very high level overview of the history of, um, of these mice. So essentially you have these three subspecies of mice that, is, that you know, arose like a, a long time ago. And um, in Asia initially, actually initially in Asia, people decided to have mice as pets. Okay, and so they started breeding them similar to how we have pets here. And then in Victorian England, uh, people also decided to have mice as pets and they actually bred these pet, these kind of um, English pets with these Asian pets to try to make kind of really exotic looking pet mice. Um, and that actually created, and, and, then, and then about 100 years ago, um, in, um, someone bought these mice, pet mice, and essentially inbred them. And then these mice are now like one of the foundations of medical research. Okay, so um, uh, my point here is, is that the, the genetic composition of the mice that we use today is really, um, it's really complex and it's completely arbitrary, okay? Uh, and, and comes from accidental, okay? So um, in, a, in a study, that, actually an original study on this, we, we looked at uh, 38 inbred strains of mice and we took their genome and we, gener we just drew a tree for them, okay? Clearly, there's not a tree because they're, this is a, we just use Phylip on this, but this is just a visualization because they're actually bred with each other and there's a lot of really complex um, sharing and, and since they're inbred, there's really no notion of who's the parent of who because um, that concept gets really, um, gets really lost when uh, things are inbred. But you can really, but just as a visualization to give you a kind of a high level view, you can see that there's really two major groups here uh, between, um, like among these 38 strains, okay? Um, and one of the groups these, these two groups, and that's a very long branch length between these two groups. And one of these groups is uh, what are called classical inbred strains. So these are the strains that actually are mostly descendant from what were the pets, pet mice, okay? And then these wild-derived strains, um, these are the mice that if you wanted to, if you want to create a wild-derived strain, you would found a, find a mice, mouse in your kitchen you would, like, or caught in the wild, you would then breed it for 20 generations, like brother, uh, brother, sister mating, and then you would get a wild derived strain. So these are mice that are, that were not, you know, were never pets, okay? And so you can imagine, and they're actually pretty far apart, okay, genetically. So you can imagine that, and actually all the wild derived are also very far apart from each other as well. Um, you can imagine that there would be very different traits 
between wild mice and um, kind of like what were pet mice, okay? So can anyone imagine what would be a good trait for a wild mouse? Like if you were a wild mouse, what would you want to be? Escape. Yeah, like fast, yeah. Fast smart, right? Um, also small, right? All these kind of escape, you know. And when, if you imagine humans breed, breed, um, breed like mice, okay, breed pets, what do they want? What do they, well, what kind of traits would they want? Slow. Huh? Yeah, like dumb, right? Blind. blind, yeah. Actually, so I think dumb and blind are, are inadvertent because the, the smart ones and the fast ones, they essentially escape and they leave the gene pool, right? Um, but uh, they also, people like kind of big furry mice, right? And actually, since I live in Los Angeles now, I have to change this because people now are breeding dogs smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So that kind of goes against my theory. But, but at least with mice, people like big mice, okay? So if you look at phenotypes between these two groups, essentially, if you look at body weight, um, every, every classical inbred mouse is larger than every uh, wild-derived mouse. Okay, so now let's go back. Okay, so now, so now let's say that we were interested in doing association with body weight uh, of, between the mice, um, like between, like association of body weight in the mouse, okay? So what, when you do association, this is kind of what you expect to see, okay? So this is a Manhattan, called a Manhattan plot for those uh, people not, not familiar with this. Essentially, that's the mouse genome, okay, on the x-axis, and the vertical line is essentially the, the measure of the significance of the correlation between that genetic variant and the trait. Okay, and this is what you expect to see. You expect to see that there, you know, most of the genome is not correlated with the trait, okay, and a, you know, few places you have some correlation, okay, and you can kind of quantify that by what, basically looking at the cumulative p-value distribution, okay, so the cumulative p-value distribution will, will, should look, follow this line, y equals x. Why? Because in general, p-values, when there's no, so there's no effect, should be randomly distributed between zero and one. And we expect if there's a tiny fraction of um, associations, then right around zero, we should see an enrichment, but for most of the range, there shouldn't be anything. And then the QQ plot is exactly the same as a cumulative p-value distribution, but it's just basically looking on the log scale. So you're essentially zooming into that small part. So that's why, but like most of, you know, this part of the line is kind of you know, a compressed version of the majority of that line. So they really should follow what's expected. They, they really should follow what's expected, okay? So, of course, um, what did we see? We saw this, okay? So we saw virtually every loci, every, every gene, every position of the genome had huge associations with body weight. Um, we were very excited uh, at first. <laughs> we thought we, we even had this crazy idea that we were going to engineer, you know, like the world's largest mouse, right? Um, so, but then we talked to uh, some people, and they pointed out that we should run these QQ plots, and this is what our QQ plots look like. And if anyone's done a human GWAS, they know that that looks actually pretty funny. So, so what's going on? Um, and in some sense, you know, you can't really blame the association method because this is what's going on. So here's actually a SNP now. We have this purple and green allele, and this SNP basically separates between uh, the classical mice and the domestic mice. And, and also, if you look at it, just looking at it, right, you would say that, hey, the SNP is highly correlated with body weight, right? It's not doing any, I mean, the, the association test is doing the right thing, but we know that that, that sounds kind of weird. Um, and the intuition is, is that if we somehow, if, if, we, if I show you the phylogy again, you can say like, oh, okay, well, I don't really care about this SNP. This SNP can't be the one because, you know, look, there's the, the, the tree somehow and the SNP are, are telling me the same information. So somehow this, the tree gives you some information to say that, oh, I don't really, I want to discount the SNP because it's just tracking the information of the tree, okay? so. Um, let, me, let me just summarize kind of the graphical model to make it clearer. So we have two, in general, we're, we're measuring um, correlation. Uh, we're interested in understanding if the phenotype is, is correlated with the SNP, and we have two hypotheses. The null hypothesis is that they're independent, okay? 
and the alternate hypothesis is that they're, you know, that, that, that they're, they'd be correlated. Okay, so if that's the case, we could just test to see if there is correlation between these two, and that would distinguish between, between these two hypotheses. Um, unfortunately, if we have um, population structure or some kind of relatedness between individuals, because of these kind of uh, um, unknown factors, what happens is that this population structure will affect many SNPs. So many SNPs will be, um, you know, kind of relate, uh, will be, a, you get this long branch length, any SNPs along that branch length will be kind of a, uh, like the population structure will affect the, the values of many SNPs. Similarly, the population structure, just because, you know, in this case we had different selection pressure on the um, wild and, and domestic mice, they affect the phenotypes, and so that kind of induces correlation between many SNPs and the phenotype. Okay, so in this case, uh, when, when we have population structure, what happens is that both in the, in the scenario that the SNP doesn't affect the trait, and if the SNP does affect the trait, um, we see that there's a correlation between the SNP and the uh, phenotype. So checking for that correlation actually is, does not, is not able to, to give us what we want, which is to understand if the SNP is, is affecting the trait. Um, so, and, so there's actually a, um, many papers, actually or the early papers in, in, in this mouse GWAS actually didn't correct for population structure. Um, and they were looking at very small samples. Some were looking at like 16 mice and stuff like that. Um, and, but they were able to report these great associations because they, the population structure, which is actually, if you think about it, um, it's actually not such a bad thing because had they, if they didn't report the associations, then nobody would have actually gone in, got excited about and worked in that area to find the problems. And so now, um, so actually, we would never, we, I wouldn't be here today, right, if it wasn't for these papers. So I'm very grateful. Um, these are the pioneers, yeah, I'm very grateful. Okay, so, um, so, okay, so let's go back. So what's going on? So we, again, we have these unmodeled factors, and again, these unmodeled factors are what's essentially, you know, kind of their, their, the effects of the SNPs of these unmodeled factors you can think of on different sides of that long branch length is what's really confounding our ability to do association. Um, and so, so we, we, we obviously can't know this, but we can know something about this by taking this idea, which we can say that, okay, let's look pairwise between, let's say, our mouse strains. So here's actually two, two, mount, two uh, cl uh, classical, um, these are two classical inbred strains, Black 6 and C3H, and they are ve like very similar genomes, okay? And so let's, uh, this is a toy example. I'm looking at 10 SNPs, okay? And they are, nine out of 10 of these SNPs are the same. So let's just, you know, from this toy example, assume that all the even number SNPs are actual causal variants that have kind of a non-zero beta that affect the trait, okay? So I might, n I will not know, I, I might not know what that, what those values are, but I will know that these two strains will have a similar value for their unknown confounding, for that, that kind of unmodeled factor, because so many of their SNPs are the same, okay? Um, on the other hand, if I look at Castaneous, which is a wild-derived strain, you know, in this case, almost all the SNPs are different. So, you know, if the same SNPs are causal, um, for the, I also won't know necessarily what the values of these unmodeled factors are for each of these, but I'll know that, but I can predict that they would be different from each other, okay? And if I generalize this and look at kind of all pairs, and if I just, if I actually just make a matrix which just contains how many share, how many SNPs are, are shared in each pair, um, what, what do I, uh, you know, what, what does that give me? So that gives, that gives me kind of a, a blueprint for which which pairs have similar values for those unmodeled factors, and which ones which ones have dissimilar values. And so the the key idea uh, behind what uh, what our, our work here is that what we do is we extend the uh, simple model to uh, include a term which is basically a random effect. Okay that somehow captures these unmodeled factors. And that the basic idea is that the, uh, these unmodeled factors will have a covariance, the, the, this, this random 
um, this random vector, which we don't, obviously don't, we're going to try to estimate from the data, is going to have a covariance structure, which is going to be dependent on how much of the genome these are shared. Okay, so the, uh, and then using kind of a likelihood model, we'll be able to kind of fit the data in order to, to estimate and, and to correct for this. Okay, so that's, that's the idea behind linear mixed models. Um, and it turns out uh, that if I go back to my hypothetical true model, and I just add the assumption that these beta i's are, are actually drawn from a normal distribution with effect size, um, with, 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 with mean zero and variance sigma squared g, then what, ha what happens is that um, the, the, it turns out that, that the, using a mixed model, a linear mixed model, um, and uh, making that assumption and just doing kind of Bayesian regression with that assumption, are equivalent under some kind of like normalization of the genotypes and some other assumptions that are a little bit technical and I'm not, not going to get here. So this is kind of the basics of, of, <coughs> of mixed models and kind of why they work. And here's actually, so, so this is kind of again the linear mixed model, so uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of how it's used. So you have a, um, you have this, this model, um, you have, it's called a mixed model because you have both uh, fixed effects, which are, you're trying to estimate like the mean, uh, beta i, the, the, SNP, the effect of the SNP, and you're also trying to estimate these random effects, and particularly you're trying to estimate these parameters like uh, sigma squared g and sigma squared e, which are like the, the kind of the variance, like how much of the variance is captured by the um, kind of interrelatedness of the individuals and how much of the variance is, is, ca is just environmental variance. And um, when you're doing, and, so, and you're essentially taking your data and you're trying to fit all these parameters and then you can look at a, a kind of a, a, essentially an F test to compare if you have a SNP effect versus not to get a p-value. Um, but the key step is you have to estimate all these parameters and this can be kind of uh, difficult. So you have to estimate these, um, these variance components, sigma squared g, sigma squared e, and the traditional approaches um, were, very, were very inefficient. Um, and so we actually came up with a, a, a method, this is actually a, a, a while ago called EMMA, for doing the, the estimates. And I'm covering it here because um, I think it's, it's still important to kind of, and in, in it's a really um, simple way to understand like what the more kind of more recent uh, developments in mixed models are. Yeah. Um, I just lost the plot a little. What's, what's K again? Oh, K is the, the K is the um, kind of pairwise genetic relatedness between individuals estimated from all the SNPs, okay? Is there any, this is a good point for a question, is that, yeah? So it seems like you're building some type of distance matrix to take into account the phylogenetic correlation or whatever kind yes, of Yes, yes, yes. Okay. But then it, there's also some implicit assumption about independence between sites, is that? Uh, there's a lot of assumptions well, yeah, um, that, no, 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 I'm, I'm saying there's a lot yeah. of assumptions and there's a lot of actually work now kind of improving mixed models, kind of unraveling different effects of assumptions. Okay. So I'm just thinking um, like linkage might for Yeah, so like there's like a whole than line than of work saying how to estimate kinship matrices taking into account LD, should you, should you not, does it affect it, does it not, there's okay. like a lot, yeah, yeah. So, okay. But I mean that's a great question and great intuition. Um, but I, I'm here now kind of, a, there's like a lot of caveats that I'm kind of ignoring just to kind of give the high level thread. Any, any more questions on that? Okay, so, so anyway, so, so now we get to kind of like a little technical, uh, so, so we want to estimate these variance components, so, so um, how does Emma work? So here's the, here's actually the kind of the basics, okay, so you, you want to compute the likelihood of your data, okay, for a mixed model and um, you, here's actually, so you, the likelihood of data will now follow a multivariate normal distribution, okay, with a certain, vari the variance will be basically sigma squared g times the kinship matrix plus sigma squared e times the identity matrix, and uh, there's also a, a, a fixed effect beta, and this is the likelihood, of, this is the likelihood that you want to compute, and the difficulty is, is that um, your variance actually is a function of your parameters, sigma squared g and sigma squared e, and you have to invert it um, in order to compute the likelihood. And so as you're searching in that parameter space, every time you have to invert the matrix. And so this is actually why uh, the original implementations of mixed models were really um, like un unusable, because 
you know, if you, you imagine you had to do this for like a, a, a large data set with a lot of SNPs and at every iteration you had to do this in versions, um, that was really difficult. And so uh, Hyunman Kang in my lab, who's now a faculty in Michigan, really came up with this insight, which uh, we call the Emma trick. Um, and the new kind of methods for mixed model optimization are also used very similar ideas. So the basic idea is that um, you, you represent K, instead of just treating K in its natural form, what you do is you, you basically do a um, eigenvalue decomposition. Okay, and you get the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues, and you represent it as, you know, you, is this, in its diagonalized form. And so then the, the V matrix is just going to be basically the, because, you know, because the identity matrix is also diagonalized as well. It's, it's always diagonal. Um, you could just represent the, the V like this, and then if you also, you compute the Z matrix, which is kind of like, um, the U transpose times the, the fixed effects. And after you do this, the likelihood becomes essentially this, okay? And if you notice is that, you know, this part is inverted right here, okay? But now you're just, this inverted part is just, you're inverting in every step when you're iterating over these two parameters, you're inverting something that's already diagonal. So you can do, that doesn't take any time. So that's the whole idea behind it, and that's kind of, so, you, you have to only once compute this uh, uh, spectral decomposition, and then, um, and then the rest of it is, is pretty fast. And so people since that time have kind of done some improvements to actually kind of get rid of the fact that you, you need to do this for every SNP, so like there are newer methods that are, that are, that are faster, but this is the, the, the basic idea. Um, so um, this is what, after applying Emma to the same data, we saw no association with body weight. This is an example where we saw nothing, and we were very excited that we saw nothing. Um, and, but we did find some other associations. And so since that time, um, there's been a, a, a lot of, you know, Emma's gotten kind of a cult following in uh, various, like, uh, non-human um, non systems and kind of a lot, a lot of plant. Like, and we've been very um, interested in applying Emma to mouse genetics. And so since that time, there have been, uh, our group and other groups have been very involved in mouse GWAS. And so for those people who are, um, you know, either I interested or not interested in human GWAS, um, maybe you can look at mouse GWAS. I think there's a lot of interesting problems and interesting things to do there. And um, there's also a human counterpart, uh, Emma X as well. And I'm actually going to skip over it a little bit because I want to get to uh, the, the, uh, some newer work. Okay, so um, so that was mixed models, and so the the idea. So that was the basic idea. And so the idea is that actually uh, these techniques are actually much more general than for correcting for population structure, but they can be used for generating confounding. So what I'm interested here, I'm going to talk about for the my uh, my remaining time is about um, EQTL studies. Okay, this is an area of interest uh, by the community where you're trying to understand. Gen how genetic variation affects expression, okay? And um, what I'm particularly, so, so what, so if, the, if you look at the, kind of the most basic thing that you can do is that, you know, you have the expression level of, let's say, M genes, gene one through gene, gene M. You know, the basic analysis is to just do a genome-wide association study for each one of these, these genes. So you end up with, the, the, it's very di difficult, though, to visualize it in this way if you have this kind of, you know, stack of, uh, you know, 20,000 Manhattan plots. So what we do, um, just, just for visualization, is we basically rotate them vertically, okay, and we stack them one along and we look down on them, okay, and essentially we cut off, make a, make a cutoff, okay, so this is looking, so on the, x-axis are, are the SNP locations, on the y-axis are the um, probe locations, okay, and the intensity of a point, um, if it's above some value, is essentially the association, the measure of the association between the SNP and the probe, okay, so it's the same information, just uh, visualized in, the, in a different way so we can actually see all of it together. Um, um, okay, so so uh, this is a kind of an EQTL plot. This is actually a classic data set collected by uh, 
um, Leonid Krugbeck. And so you could, just looking at it, you, you see some really obvious structures here, okay? So one structure that you see, so first, yes, yeah, so again, this is what I meant to say. This is actually looking at uh, about 3,000 markers and, and about 6,000 expressions, okay? Um, so one real obvious structure is this kind of diagonal band, okay? And that's what we call the cis EQTL band, okay? That's basically SNPs that are affecting um, themselves. I mean, SNPs that are genes that, are, that affect the expression of genes that they're in or near. Okay? And we expect that to be true. These are, you know, it can be SNPs and promoters, et cetera. Okay? Um, the, and, and, and it's good that we see this because that kind of gives us a measure of uh, true positives. If, we don't, if you do an analysis and you don't see one, you know that something went really horribly wrong. Like maybe your uh, sample IDs are off or something like that. Um, so another very interesting structure is basically these, these vertical lines. Okay, and this is actually what I would say is the most, what, what, what brings the most interest. So these are what's called um, uh, trans-regulatory bands. So these are SNPs, okay, that then affect um, uh, kind of genome-wide patterns of gene expression. Okay, and these are really interesting uh, for a lot of reasons. So this is a SNP that affects many probes, okay, and one of the real interesting and kind of um, nice thing is maybe the SNP actually affects some kind of a master regulator, right? that then has many downstream effects. Okay, so this is actually uh, really what we want. We want to actually identify these master regulators that, that, that might give us a lot of information about kind of how the um, expressions, the structure of expression in, the, in, the, um, in that tissue. So this is actually very important to identify. But of course, we don't, we don't see that directly. We only see the correlation between, this, in this data, the SNP and, and all these other, uh, all these, um, other uh, these, these genes, uh, but we like to that. That's why it's of so such interest. So we're actually very interested in these um, in these ex, uh, expression, these these hotspots, regulatory hotspots, um, and uh, which w transregulatory bands and hotspots are the same thing. So are, are defined to be the same thing. So we're we want to look at this. And if we look at this really classic data set, there's this classic data set of looking at BXD mice that report a lot of hotspots. And they actually did something very interesting. So BXD mice are inbred strains of mice, so you can actually get identical twins of the same, basically, genetic animal. And what they did was they actually collected two animals per strain, okay, and uh, collected expression in each one. And then what they did was they just averaged the expression values together and then did their analysis, uh, their, their EQTL analysis on there. And they reported many things. So we thought, oh, this is perfect, you know? Why don't what we do, because we're interested in things like power, robustness, et cetera, why don't we just, you know, randomly, you know, pick one of the strains into one group, okay, do the EQTL analysis in one, you know, in one, for one rep set of replicates, and for, for the second set of replicates, and then we can maybe compare to see, you know, first of all, how similar are they to each other, you know, um, how similar are they to the, to the combined analysis, et cetera. Okay? And so in order to do that, we need to have somehow quantify the strength of, of hotspots. Okay, so how, how strong is a hotspot? And so for this, you know, we have a kind of real heuristic approach here, which is that we just take in that column, we just sum all the negative log p values together, okay? And that just gives us some kind of a measure of how hotspots-ish is that, is that probe. So that really has no meaning, but it's just useful for visualization. So for example, if I, if I look here, you can see that where there's a lot of red, the, our little kind of heuristic is high, and when there's not a lot of red, it's lower. Okay, so just a way to visualize. Okay? So we did this. Here's actually what we found. Um, uh, so this is red is, uh, red is one uh, replicate and green is the other, so we found that they're inconsistent between the replicates. Okay? So we said, oh, that's really weird. Well, maybe it's like a power issue. Okay, so let's randomize the data and try again, see what happens. So then we randomized the data, and then we found that we actually, the randomized data, we found even stronger hotspots than we found in, in unrandomized data. So that was really weird, right? And we actually found that, that in our, our original data was particularly not strong. It was a p-value of only 0.89, okay, for the strongest hotspot. So that's really weird. Um, so, so what's going on? So then what we did is we actually uh, used, because we were, doing Emma at the time. So we used the same code of Emma to compute 
essentially kind of like a kinship matrix, but between the arrays themselves. Okay, so and to generate these kind of inner sample correlation plots. So let me explain exactly what this plot is. So um, each each row and column. So so each of these each of these dots represents the correlation between an array. So a, ra a gene expression array might have like twenty thousand measurements. And it's just the correlation between those two vectors. And here's actually, so, so, and so of course, like, we have one replicate on, so, so along the diagonal is, is, because we have two strains, it's like the replicate, the, the two replicates within the strain against each other. This is one replicate, uh, you know, one pair of replicates. This is another pair of replicates, okay? So we would expect to see a lot of enrichment along this diagonal, and we don't see that. Uh, in this in this data, and furthermore, if you look at this data, you see there's a clear batch effect. Okay, it looks like, and when we looked at the dates, we saw that these guys were all collected together, and then these guys were all collected together. Right, so within the batch, so we saw this. Okay, so then what our our hypothesis is is that you know the SNP might actually be not correlated with you know some kind of master regulator, but might correlate with some kind of systematic confounding which then induces correlation with the, the array. So, and we actually, we tested that by doing the following. We basically took our original data, we looked at this inner sample correlation matrix from the data, then we generated simulated data just using that same covariance structure, and then ran our, ran our approach, and what we saw is we saw that all the hotspots are in the same place. So it's actually the inner sample correlation matrix is enough to explain where the hotspots occur. Um, and so then, here's actually a kind of a graphical model explaining this. So we have, um, we have like movement have some real hotspots, like the SNP might be affecting these these three genes, but then we also have some kind of confounding factors like batch effects that might be affecting you know all the other genes. And so just sometimes by chance, a SNP might be correlated, but with a confounding factor. And because we have so many SNPs, that can happen, right? We have uh, thousands of SNPs. So then this SNP will look like it's a it's a confounding factor. Okay, so. Um, so how do we, uh, so okay, so this is basically, so we actually came up with a, uh, a, a, the same idea to address this, so why don't we just take this, this inner sample correlation matrix and then use that as our kind of a, like the same way that we use the genetic similarity matrix in, in, in Emma to, 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 to correct for it. So, um, so we, we did that, so what does that do? So that basically, it's kind of like we're conditioning on all the gene expression values, okay? And then what happens is that we're then blocking the kind of effect of this confounding factor. So then this SNP will no longer be a hotspot, okay? Because um, <laughs> because we kind of took this effect out. That's like the, that's essentially what we did. Um, unfortunately, what also happens is that when we when we condition all this, we also if there's a real hotspot, we also kind of uh, get rid of that as well, okay? So this is actually so if you look at before and after, this is that we have a method called ICE. And um, so we eliminate all the hotspots, but there's a, so so so. But one of the interesting things is, is that these bands, this kind of diagonal band, the cis band, actually got a lot stronger. So in some sense, we're capturing more signal. Um, Here is actually some plots showing that uh, between replicates and across tissues, we, we do better. Okay, we actually captures more, and then. Um, um, and we capture more. Okay, so, so the question. So this is. So, so the question is. So, so at the time, um, we, there was still a question, which was, you know, do hotspots really exist? Okay, and um, we really didn't have a way to. to so let, let me just summarize. What does ICE say? So ICE basically says that this this work says that um, we these confounding factors can induce hotspots. Okay. Um, and we have a, that we know, and then um, SNPs actually can be correlated with those confounding factors causing hotspots, but then also there may be other hotspots, so our technique to remove that, okay, also removes real hotspots. And so, um, at the time, we actually thought that they didn't exist, okay, and um, we were, and you know, if we had a blog, imagine what we could have done, right? Um, so, but... Um, <laughs> It turns out right around the same, you know, like, like Leonid Krugwag actually happened to move, who collected the original data, happened to move from Seattle to, um, to Princeton, and he redid his experiment, okay? And um, if you look at the two data, these are the two data sets for the collected 2005, 2008, 
And if you look at the overlap between the two of them, um, they're actually hotspots. So what's actually shared between, so this is a proof, that, and actually there's also protein activity levels that he also measure that found in the same places. So actually show that these, these, these things do exist. Um, but our, so these are the, where the true hotspots are. Again, this is just the overlap between these two. Our true hotspots, but ice kind of eliminates them. So, um, so th this is actually, we were stuck for, for, for many years, and I'm happy to report that we actually had a new idea uh, not too long ago uh, for how to address this. And our basic intuition is this, is that, and, um, is that hotspots, like things like batch effects, uh, will affect all genes, okay? But genetic factors will only affect a subset of genes. It's not plausible to think that a, a genetic factor will affect half of the genes or you know, something like that. So the genet true genetic effects will always should be stronger than confounding effects. So they'll be affected by both true genetic factors and any batch effects. And so if we correct for confounding using only the weaker genes, um, then we would basically block the hot spots and not the, the others. So for example, here is actually if I rank if these genes are ranked by the strength of the effect then if I just use the bottom genes, it will somehow block the confounder, uh, the effect of the confounder, but not the actual um, true hotspot. And so this led to our, our method named NICE, Next Generation ICE, right? We figured, why not? Um, and um, so we actually, this is what the true hotspots, these are the EQTL plots, and this is kind of just a, a, a visualization. So the overlapped identified 10 hotspots, and um, if, if you look at ICE, uh, so NICE basically is able to, to predict. So again, we're looking, I, I didn't explain the experiment. We're looking at the 2005 data, analyzing it, and then using the 2008 data to v verify whether or not we actually, like what's real and what's not real, what, what's overlap not. So NICE is able to identify nine hotspots with two spurious hotspots, while ICE is actually um, only missed a lot of them. Um, and so there's other projects that I'm happy to talk to people in the remaining part of the conference uh, while we're here. And um, I'd like to acknowledge, there's a lot, this covered actually many years, like this is a long thread in our lab. So Hyun Min Kang and uh, Jimmy Yi um, were, were actually kind of pioneers of the ICE and, and Emma and Joanne. Um, is now currently that she's she's working on nice and um, that paper is, should be coming out soon and Jay Hoon and uh, actually and Noah and Boom were also involved and then all the mouse stuff that we did at UCLA has been with Jake Lucis and uh, Emma X was done with Kara Sabati and um, this is our lab website thanks. I mean, yeah, that could. I mean, that could have been. Yeah, yeah. Well, we actually did miss. We did miss one, right? And so we think that that was the one. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so, so it's actually very closely related. So um, um, if you normalize, you know, assuming you're normalizing things correctly the same way, then actually your heritability will be uh, your estimate of sigma squared G divided by sigma squared G plus sigma squared E. So it's actually very similar. So the, the real thing that uh, Vischer, uh, I mean, there's a, one of the things that I'd like to mention there is that when I talk about this normalization, that means that you're kind of making assumptions about, um, you know, like kind of how different minor allele frequencies affect different traits. And so that actually goes in. Those things that I swept under the rug um, greatly affect uh, these kind of estimates of heritability. But the basic technique is, is the same technique. Um, I mean, why do people estimate heritability? Yeah. Um, 
That's a great question. Um, I think I, I think that um, so uh, pr practically, I, I think that the main the main there's a, there's a bunch of reasons why. One is it gives you the upper bound of what you can find in association studies. So that might give you guidance to know if how much more money should you put in, how many big larger samples. Um, it also gives you an idea of maybe that there's information in the data that we're not directly able to uh, implicate the, the variance. That's one thing, right? Um, I, I think that's probably the biggest thing. I think also it answers, um, it can give you some insights into uh, fundamental questions about what is the genetic architecture of traits, okay? Looking at the heritability and how the heritability um, is partitioned into different um, you know, kind of classes of allele frequencies gives you something about, you know, gives you some information um, into I'm trying to understand the architecture of, of the traits. So. Thank you, Eliza.